And everybody else said yes, right? The quantum, me quantum mechanics is the most successful physical theory ever, right? We get transistors, we get computers from it. So it looks like even though Einstein helped to contribute to the creation of quantum mechanics, he hated it. He hated it. So it looks like Einstein was wrong. God does play dice. So I had this crazy idea. My crazy idea was maybe what's really happening here, because I thought the problem was larger. This was the tip of the iceberg, that things were really much worse. Maybe what we really have here in pure mathematics is randomness. In other words, maybe sometimes the reason you can't prove something is not because you're stupid or because you haven't worked on it long enough. The reason you can't prove something is because there's nothing there. The, that sometimes the reason you can't solve a mathematical problem isn't because you're not smart enough or you're not determined enough. It's because there is no solution because maybe the mathematical question has no structure. Maybe the answer has no pattern. Maybe there is no order or structure that you can try to understand in the world of pure mathematics. That sometimes the reason you don't see a pattern or structure is because there is no pattern or structure. And one of the things that, one of my motivations was the prime numbers. There's some work on the prime numbers which say that in some ways the pr prime numbers can be looked at statistically and they seem to be playing a game a little bit. There seems to be a certain amount of randomness in the distribution of primes. That's one of the ways that people try to think heuristically about the prime numbers. Even, in, element, even in, in, in number theory, which is the queen of mathematics, according to some, of pure mathematics, according to some people. So, so on the one hand, I heard this talk about probabilistic ways of thinking about the primes. This was heuristic. And, all, and this stuff about God plays dice in fundamental physics, what goes on the atom is random. And I begin to think, well, maybe that's what's going on here. So it, uh, this project, so this is, this is what, I, uh, what I set out to do. And this project took a long time. One of the first steps is clarifying, as Manuel said, what do you mean by randomness? What do you mean by lack of structure, lack of structure, lack of order, lack of pattern? So this is a kind of a logical notion of randomness rather than a statistical notion of randomness. It's not like in physics where you say, is a physical process random, like coin tossing? I don't care where something comes from. I just look at something and say, does it have structure or pattern or not? So this is a lo logical or structural randomness as opposed to physical unpredictability and randomness. It's a different. It's very closely related, but they're, but they're different. Okay? So, so, so as Manuel said, the, the idea I came up with, and uh, Kolmogorov came up with it uh, at the same time uh, independently, is the idea that something is random if it's most, uh, well, if it, if, it's, if it can't be compressed into a shorter description. If essentially you just have to write it out as it is. In other words, there's no concise theory that produces it. So, for example, a set of physical data would be random if the only way to publish it is to publish it as is in a table. But if there's a theory, you're compressing a lot of observations into a small number of theoretical principles or laws. And the more the compression, the better the theory. You know, Occam's razor, the best theory is the simplest theory. I would say that a theory is a program that um, also Ray Salmanoff did some thinking about this in induction. He didn't go on to define randomness, but he should have. Um, the idea that the complexity, if you think of a theory as a program that calculates the observations, the, 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 the smaller the program is relative to the output, which is the, the observations, the better a theory it is. So in other words, so by the way, this is also what axioms do. I would say that axioms is the same idea. You have a lot of theorems of mathematical truth, and you're compressing them into a set of axioms. Now, why is this good? Because, it's, because then there's less risk. You know, the, because the axioms are hypotheses that you have to make, and every time you make an hypothesis, uh, you have to take it on faith, and there's risk. You're not proving it from anything. You're taking it as a given. And the less you assume, the safer it is. So if the, the fewer axioms you have, the better off you are. And so the more compression of a lot of theorems, of a body of theory, into a small set of axioms, the, the, the better off you are, I would say, in mathematics as well as physics. 
Okay, so, so this is this notion of lack of structure or randomness. So you have to define it first. If I'm going to find randomness or lack of structure, lack of pattern in pure mathematics, first I've got to say, what do I mean by that? And it turns out that, um, so I like to call this, this subject algorithmic information theory that deals with this, algorithmic information, uh, or, or can call it complexity if you like, program size complexity. The basic concept is to look at the size of the most concise program, the smallest program. I don't care about running time. It's the most concise program that calculates something. This, that's the number of bits I have to give a computer in order to get it to produce this object. That's my most concise description, algorithmic description of something, and that's how I measure its complexity. It's algorithmic information content or it's program size complexity. This is like recursive function theory for those of you who are into this stuff. I don't care about runtime, so this is very impractical. So in that sense also, what I'm doing is 1930s stuff, you know, re with this one extra idea thrown in of program size, looking at the program size. So what happens when you start looking at the size of programs? And then, and then something is random if the smallest program that calculates it is the same size as it is. There's no compression, okay? So the whole idea is look at the size of computer programs. Don't care about runtime. If it takes a billion, billion years, I don't care. I just want to know information is the only thing I'm thinking about, bits of information, size of computer programs. Okay? So what happens when you start playing with this idea? Well, what happens is everywhere you turn, you get incompleteness and undecidability, and you get it in the worst possible way. For example, it turns out the first thing you want to do is you can never decide whether an individual string of digits satisfies this definition or not. Impossible. You can never calculate the program size complexity of anything. You can never determine what the size of the smallest program is. If you have a program to calculate something, that gives you an upper bound. Its size is an upper bound on the program size complexity of what it calculates. But you can never prove any lower bounds. And that's the result. That's my first incompleteness result in this area, and I think Jack Schwartz got very excited about it. And it's an observation, I think Manuel will confirm, that in, in, in normal, more practical, more useful uh, complexity theory where you talk about time rather than bits of information, upper bounds, lower bounds are much, much harder than upper bounds, right? To get lower bounds on complexity is much, much harder than getting upper bounds on complexity. If you find a clever algorithm, you get an upper bound. On the, on the time it takes to calculate something, if you find a way to do it that's fast, you've shown that it can be done that fast. The problem is to show that you've gotten the best possible, the fastest possible algorithm. That's much harder, right? But it can be done in some cases within a class of possible algorithms. Well, in this area, you can't prove any lower bounds. And I had an article about this in 1975 in Scientific American on this subject. The basic idea is that you can't prove any lower bounds on program size complexity of individual objects. Okay? So in particular, even though most strings of digits would satisfy this definition, they're incompressible in this sense. They're random in this sense of algorithm, lack of structure. It turns out you can show easily that most objects satisfy this definition. They have no structure. You know, if you, if, if you, have, if you look at all 100-digit numbers, almost all of them are, have, no have no structure according to this definition. But you can never be sure in individual cases. You can never prove in individual cases that this is the case. And my worst incompleteness result, I have all of five minutes left. My very worst incompleteness result, let me just mention it, where you have complete lack of structure in pure mathematics, has to do with a number I defined called the halting probability. So I have no time to say how this number is defined. It's, it's very simple. Turing said you can't decide whether a program halts. There's no mechanical procedure. And I say, well, let's consider a real number which